Welcome to another episode of Business with Passion. Each show features guests who have transformed their long-term passion into a successful business. I'm your host, Jay Hamilton Roth. My marketing strategy business grew from my love of talking passionate business owners. In this series, I share their passion with you. So if you're looking for inspiration to enhance your business passion, keep watching. I think of myself as a person who likes to work in, in three dimensions. And I, I work with all sorts of forms, a lot of planar forms, and that results in the toy as an example. I have a family of 11 brothers and sisters, and they're all creative people. My father uh, was an architect working for the federal government doing federal building design. My mother liked to draw. We had no coloring books. My dad would always bring home big rolls of paper, and that's how we'd be able to be building things. We never had any money, so we made things all the time. My brothers and sisters and I used to construct go-karts and forts and all those kinds of mechanical things. When I was in sixth grade, I had a teacher who, uh, he, for some reason, he understood that I needed to not be doing the kind of work that other people were doing, and he allowed me to, to draw mazes all of the time. And I had a friend, Dale Amolino, he and I would sit there and draw mazes endlessly every day. And we came up with this interesting concept of, of having a maze with arrows in it. And so that meant that you could only go one direction once you pass that way, and you can get trapped rather than being able to back up and start again. In, uh, I guess I was a junior in high school, I took an art class, who, and the teacher gave us a problem, which was to design a board game. And I really was bad at playing board games. My sisters and brothers would beat me all the time. And so I thought, well, I love mazes, but I've got to think of some kind of thing which would be a game related to that. And my first solution, which was really stupid, was to create, a, I call it a, a ball race maze, or a marble race maze. And it was a series of four channels that would spin around and zigzag in a figure eight, and then whichever marble reached the end first would win. And I figured it would be based on how well I built the thing and, and who dropped what marble in which track. I had absolutely no skill in it at all. And so I flipped the page over and I was sketching another idea. I, that's one of my typical things to do is to really work out something in drawing form. And I drew this box. And it was a, a you know, very poorly drawn box, very poorly drawn idea. And it was, though, the precursor to this idea of making a, a, a three-dimensional maze. I used to play with this game called Labyrinth, and it's a little maze ball thing, you turn these two knobs and it tilts the plate around and the ball rolls around. And I thought, well, what would it be like to be able to make one of those three-dimensional rather than on a 2D plane? So in this cube that I'd drawn, I thought, well, I'll build pathways or aqueducts and, and little bridges that would be glued to the inside of the cube. And so I showed it to the instructor and he says, okay, now you got to build it. I found that to be an almost impossible task. I had no skills how to build anything. I, I, I didn't own a, a utility knife <laughs> or glue even. And I spent all of my money, which was $20, on a little plastic case made by a, a, a plastics company. It wasn't tap plastics. They didn't have any good stuff back then. Um, this company, the guy had fingerprints glued into the plastic. And so then I got balsa wood at a, at a, at a model store and started cutting with little X-Acto knives and gluing them together and trying to construct this concept. And I discovered that I couldn't possibly make what I drew because it would block your vision of what structure would be inside of a cube. And so this concept came to mind, and I have it right here. This is my original game. I called it uh, Equilibre Able, which I had to think of something Latin. I had no... <laughs> I, I had to come up with a name that was really historic in some way, and it's called Equilibri Able, which means balanced skill. And it's made out of balsa wood. It's extremely hard to play. I've never finished it. Only one person in the history of all 30 years or so has ever finished it, and that was one of my students who picked it up and tried it the very first try, got to the end. It's a very ugly looking thing, but on the other hand, and I've modified it too many times. That's really a shame because I should have kept it the way it was the first when I first constructed it, but I've changed it and made it a little bit easier. I had a hard time figuring out 
how to build this kind of thing better looking. And I thought, well, someday I will have the skills or possibly a toy designer would have the skills to be able to make this thing into a beautiful kind of object. I would do a lot of drawing though. And in fact, building the model was scary. I had a very hard time building the model. And it took me actually a number of years before I came up with building another model because it was so time consuming and, and intimidating. Um, you know, some people say, well, how do you think of these things? Well, I spend hours and hours and hours working on these things. And it isn't a straightforward process for myself even. So as I would work out ideas, it, it dawned on me that what I'm really working with is not a, a, a single object or a sculpture, just a single sculpture inside of this cube. Instead, it's a concept. And the concept is that we have pathways that intersect and allow you to travel from one side of a pathway to another. And that's what makes it three-dimensional. And so I have a little model of that idea. I, it's not really a Mobius strip according to a mathematician, but I think of it that way. And as you can see, if you start from black here, I can move around onto green, transferring onto blue, and then through red and back to black. And so ultimately, every surface of a structure can be used as a pathway. And that's, that's the basic underlying concept for this, this game. So I developed a whole language of uh, pathway inverters, rails, uh, tubes, um, uh, zigzags, steps, and, and a whole whole cadre of devices for getting you from one place to another. And and then it so so it boiled down to it's a modular structure. Let's say that I could make zigzags. I could make two zigzags and put them together with three inverters or something, and then I would have another concept. And uh, it would be really nice at that point to be able to build some designs which allowed interchangeability. You could build one module, connect it into another, and you can make a more complex version or your own version. You can change it and make it more difficult if you wanted to. When, um, when I did my sketches, I found this is something that I teach in my own classes now. I, I realized that sketches don't create it. It does not get built from a sketch. And a sketch is false because if something's complex enough, it really takes building the physical thing in order to reveal what it is that is being uh, presented. And so none of my sketches ever turn out to be like the real thing. I think of superplexus and the whole concept of building these mazes as sculpture. And it is not just ordinary sculpture to me, it is an interactive and kinetic kind of sculpture. Um, I, my family, though, has always been interested in playing with the superplexus, and ever since I was little and making these kinds of things, they would take them with them and play with them for hours on end, in fact, days or months on end. It wasn't until I was actually in college that I really developed skills with tools. Although I had a, a complete understanding of them, and I, I tend to have an understanding of three-dimensional form, and I could look at a part of something and know what it goes to, and, and uh, but it, w it took a long time to develop hand-eye coordination skills, which is what I actually relate this concept to. It's really a, a, my original concept for the over-the-edge game was that it was for developing hand-eye coordination for children. I don't know why I had to have some lofty reason for making it. It could have just been a fun game. When uh, I, I would say that somehow I was given the opportunity when I went to college to use shop equipment and take care of the shop. And it was my friend John Watrous, who was my instructor at the time. He somehow saw in me the ability to, to understand the physical form. And so he gave me, you know, uh, he said, here's a shop, it's brand new. Can you put all the equipment together? I learned how to use a bandsaw by taking it apart and putting it together. I learned how to use a table saw correctly from the same reasoning. Uh, that's my method of learning how to do something is to physically do it in some way. I can't read instructions very well. And in fact, I, it took a long time to discover this was when I was building one of my plastic versions of the little superplexus that I, I was, my eye was starting to bother me and I went to an eye doctor and she said, well, she did all these tests and she says, well, you know, you don't have any real good depth perception. You can't really see three dimensional forms very well. <laughs> And I had already gotten a degree in sculpture and been teaching at the junior college for, I don't know, 10 years when I discovered that I've never really had spatial skills. And I can see it now that I'm in my 40s. I can tell much more easily 
that it's difficult for me to see my finger in stereo or to see anything in stereo. So her, her vision was that I probably overcompensated with my processing abilities and I would think of things in a different way and try to understand form from a more intellectual point of view rather than just to simply see it. I was in an art class, one of my uh, digital art classes, and I had a student in there. My students know a lot. and That's one of the things, I learn a lot from my students, they learn a lot from me, it's an exchange. And I had a student, Erin Montague, she was taking this a digital art class. Her brother turns out to be teaching the same kind of class in San Francisco. And I just asked her, and she's the only person in all of my years teaching that I asked any questions about this. I said, do you know anyone in the toy industry? And she says, well, mm, my brother, and he happened to do package design and uh, other kinds of graphic work for a company called KID, or Klitzner Industrial Design in San Francisco. And their sole purpose is to, well, they have several purposes. One of them, they design bottles, but their, their passion is to create toys. And they have license agreements with all the major manufacturers and all of the major distributors know who they are. They have uh, created things for Discovery Toys. They've made things for Hasbro, for you know Star Wars things. And they never really take partners in anything. But he was willing to come and have me talk to him, given that it was Aaron, his sister, who was saying. He says, you know, I've seen every possible thing under the sun. When you're in this industry, you're jaded, and, but I'll talk to you anyway. So I met with him in San Francisco. Uh, I showed him my little crummy little model, because this is all I had. And, and he's, he looked at it and I thought, he, I thought he would be the kind of person who could say, okay, we can design a really great model for this. He just said, I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is a no-brainer. And so he was willing to introduce me to Dan Klitzner. And Dan looked at these things and he immediately saw a potential for it. And he said, this is so different than anything that we work with that I would be willing to either give you contacts or become partners in some way. And they could help work on some design elements of it, packaging concepts, uh, taking it to, to companies. And we worked together for five years. And in that process, Dan would say, I'd come in like early in the morning, right before class, I would go to San Francisco, meet with them, show them something I worked on all night. And then he would say, okay, now can you make one a little bigger? <laughs> I'd run home and I'd work all night again and come in in the morning and, and give them another model. And then maybe it'd be a question, well, can we now make one of those spirals that we're talking about? And I would make another one. So over and over again, we were developing these concepts. And then uh, a, a company took it on and I have a version of it which is called, it was the first one called Perplexus. It was a little tiny one. They gave me three days to design the toy concept and then I think four days to build a physical model. And I built a model in a very short period of time. It really was not enough time to come up with a really good design. And they wanted it in a sphere and it has a timer, electronics. And they made a TV commercial, they did all of this marketing, they, they put it into uh, the toy fair, in uh, the, uh, the New York toy fair, and I flew there, and they went belly up. The company failed. And there's a long story into how that happened. It was an unfortunate thing. The person who was in charge of it was a, a, a man named Stuart Sims. He was the person who brought Rubik's Cube to the United States way early on and he really had this idea that this could be a Rubik's Cube thing phenomena and so unfortunately that got buried we had to start all over again and at that point Dan and I were thinking well you know what's the we've we've lost this now so what could I do differently and we were talking about what if one was made a little larger and it could be called the superplexus as opposed to the perplexus and so this was during the recount for Al Gore. And I was working on this, even during Thanksgiving, I brought all my tools to my sister's house and set up a little shop at their place because I had to get this done. This represents 100 hours of construction. It's an extremely complex maze that I've never finished. No one's ever come to the end of it. But when I showed it to Dan and his people, he just said, you know, this is the way to go. We need a large version of, like this. Uh, this 
is made out of styrene plastic. It was the way that I constructed is to take a little jeweler saw and to cut out the pieces and glue them together with crazy glue or with a styrene glue and hold each piece. And it's springy on the inside. There are moving elements. It's got all these different little circus kind of features to it. And yet it's totally not manufacturable. It's way too complex. Here is the finished version of Superplexus. It has uh, numbers one through 100. My intention was to have the numbers marked with color, printed on, silk screened on, so that you could see all of the numbers, but they were embossed instead in order to save money because you, know, you, you do the tooling one time and then all the numbers are there. But to set up every piece with a silk screen adds to the cost. My intention also was to have it look white or at least in very bright colors because it's difficult to see some of the pathways. There's a shine, which is any kind of lighting that you have in the room reflects on it. It becomes a bright kind of uh, ball to, is difficult to see inside of. When I built them in cubes, that was never an issue because the cubes have a flat surface and once in a while they shine. Uh, so the colors though, the colors that it became, this purple and the yellow and this bluish color uh, is based on the Boffitt colors. KID, Dan Klistner and his team invented Boffitt. And so Hasbro wanted to tie Boffitt in with Superplexus or Superplexus in with Boffitt. And um, so they could put on the package from the makers of Boffitt. Well, the, there are a few other features of this that were kind of odd or interesting problems to try to solve. One is that you notice that it's, it's, a, it's a perfect circle from the front, but from the side it's an egg shape. Not really an egg, but it's, a, it's, and it's not exactly an ellipse either, but it's a sad story, a sad tale. I will show you something here. It's a, the package that was designed by Hasbro or by Tiger Electronics, and it was meant to be two on a shelf, on a 14 inch shelf. What happened was they showed it to Toys R Us, and Toys R Us said they get a, you know, they're so large, they get a preview of what these things will be. And they said, we won't carry it unless we can fit two on a shelf. And so uh, I immediately designed a package which would work, two on a shelf, if it was made in a triangular form. Instead of being square as it is, if it was triangular, you could nest them, and they come out to exactly 14 inches. But that wasn't the way it was going to be. It was going to be killed or we have to do something. So one of the people in an email exchange says, cut it flat, just cut the spear off flat and then it can sit on a table and it won't be a problem. And I argued and argued about that, did some drawings. These are the overnight kinds of things, you know, <laughs> with Hong Kong. And came up with a, a curve which would not allow it to be distorted but would also, you know, to still make it clear but it would also then be narrow enough to fit two on a shelf. I've never been happy with that design. When it's in a perfect sphere, it just feels better in your hands. Somebody created a Superplexus site on Wikipedia. It says, not a retail success. And I assume that is, that's true if you are thinking of selling millions of something. This sold somewhere, I, I can only have an estimate because I get these royalty checks and on there is a little number and then they add it and subtract and do all these things. But somewhere around 750,000 units have sold worldwide. But for Hasbro, that's not enough, not even close to enough. That's over a three or four year time span. They want to be selling several hundred thousand per year in order to maintain this kind of, I think it's 350 or 400,000 or something. Uh, a smaller toy company would be happy with 20,000 or 50,000 units. So as far as whether or not it's considered successful, the success for me is that I've created it and that people love to play with it. And I get emails every day from somewhere in the world. It's sold in Germany, it's sold all throughout Europe. Uh, the UK was a very big deal at one point. It was in the top 10 Christmas toys for 2002, uh, along with playing cards and, and Twister and Monopoly, things like that. I have an interest in producing handmade little models, things that I could use or, or have as art pieces, like handmade individual little sculptural pieces that are complex for, for collectors, an interest in making 
ones which can be mass produced so that the average person can get a hold of these things as well. But if I could really have it in, in my uh, wildest dream version, is that people would be having, uh, they belong to the Superplexus of the Month Club. And so they would receive one that's a simple, com a simple version that's a small handheld version and then a limited edition would be produced and they would get another one. Every month they'd get another one. And uh, maybe at the end they'd also get a bag of popcorn or something to go with it. Uh, and then have competitions too, where people get to play these things for time or for like, let's say they played one-handed or other kinds of those fun competitions. I think my number one supporter is my wife. She has 100% backed up anything that I do We'd have no money, and she'd say, you need to go to New York for the toy fair. <laughs> and I'd have $300. That's our maximum we could spend. And I'd get a plane and stay with a friend, and, and she would say, do it. My first attempt at building a large-scale superplexus called Giant Superplexus is this piece. I have a preliminary name for it called Superplexus Circles because it has just so many circular elements in it. Uh, it was built primarily for the Maker Fair, which was going on in San Mateo. And I was asked by the editors of, of Make Magazine to be involved with telling the story of my superplexus. But I thought, well, why not give me the opportunity now to create a large scale version? So uh, it started out as this planar, I, it, believe me, this is not an easy thing to create. I, I've been asked at the Maker Fair to give people plans for how to build one of these. And I was saying, I, I don't have any plans. And they said, well, didn't you draw it in CAD? And I said, no. You mean, well, how did you make it then? I said, I made it by hand. And well, how did you interconnect all the elements? I said, there were no elements interconnected at all. I had to start from somewhere. So I did a little sketch, probably a few tiny little circular shapes and realized I can't sketch what this concept has to be. I have to build it. So I went, this is the reason it's four feet in diameter. The interior structure is four feet in diameter. By the time it builds the outer rings, it's somewhere around five and a half feet. But the reason that it's a four foot diameter is because that's the size, the biggest foam core I could buy. I didn't, I wanted to have a structural plane going through it. So if you see this black ring going around, there is one complete sheet in there that has as many perforations, as many holes as I could possibly put into it, yet maintain some structural integrity and then uh, and pathways. And so I would then, in order to create the next step, I would have to take a large piece of foam core cut out into the same circular diameter, the four foot diameter, and interconnect those elements and figure out how they would join and where it might go and where to cut out and remove material because it's not as it's not it's not pre-planned. The only pre-planning I had was that I knew I wanted intersecting elements and then to begin constructing individual little obstacles or, or challenges that could be plugged into various areas. But every piece had to be cut and fitted to another. One thing I know is that people love to play with superplexes. Everywhere I go, I, I show these things and I'm mobbed by people wanting to play. There's never been an issue in my mind that it would be successful. The issue really is how do I get it to somebody and, and do they have the money to pay for it, <laughs> sadly. Uh, you know, because if I had my choice and I didn't have to, to make a living, this would be something where I would be giving these away. I'd have, have them in hospitals, I'd have them in airports where people are waiting endless hours to get on a flight. I'd have them in malls where kids could spend some time, you know, their parents are shopping and the kids could play with this. Although I've received many different uh, uh, conceptual offers in producing giant superplexes, I've been working on one which is actual commission. It's, uh, as you can see, this huge sphere here. It's actually small in comparison to my large foam core model, but it's the largest one that I could practically produce given uh, the budget. It is uh, a 36 inch diameter. It's going to be built with a gimbal structure, similar to the, the wooden one which I was showing a little earlier. It has uh, the, the ball inside of it, essentially, when it falls off, you have to start over again. 
some of the open gimbal structured versions of this, which I think look more like sculpture and less like a possible game. Those ones allow you to replace the ball back onto the pathway somewhere, but this one will not allow you to do that. This is being done for a man who is a, a puzzle enthusiast. He's very much into the world of uh, puzzles. Uh, there's a club that he belongs to. I think it's called the International Puzzle Party. I might be wrong there. And uh, he had asked me to be involved in a show which will be happening. It's going to be a puzzle as art show. In order for me to be able to do this show though, in order to be able to produce a piece that's sophisticated enough for the show, he commissioned me. So I'm building the piece for him as a private party. And so it'll be exhibited in that, that show. And in there he will be inviting people from all over the world. Apparently there are people coming to the puzzle party in San Francisco that year. It's yearly it happens all over the world in different places. One time it might be in Cairo, the next year it might be in England somewhere. I always had this fantasy. In fact, it was a dream. Maybe it's a nightmare, I don't know. I, literally a dream. I woke up one morning going, wow, because I felt like, and it was in Japan, for some reason they built a full-scale, life-size superplexus and you ran around inside of it. And there were slides and things in there, but you couldn't get hurt. But if I, if I could ever build such a crazy idea that you could actually be inside of one of these things, that would be awesome. But in a more practical sense, I think I, I would love to see one of these things in a, in a museum, Museum of Modern Art. I, I would love to see one of these in the Getty. Thanks for watching this episode of Business with Passion. If you'd like more information about Michael McGinnis, other shows, or to be a guest on a future show, go online to tv.manygoodideas.com.